Um, it is my great pleasure today to welcome you all here and particularly to welcome uh, Timothy Parsons from Washington University in St. Louis. He's an historian of Africa and of imperialism more broadly. Um, he's published extensively on the social history of East Africa, including work on the Boy Scout movement, on the social components of colonial militaries as well. Um, right now, he's working on a pro he's, uh, working on a project entitled The World Comes of Age, sorry, The World Comes of Age, Globalization, World History, in 19th Century will appear very shortly with Oxford University Press. Um, and he's currently writing a book to appear with Cambridge University Press entitled The World in the 20th Century, A Social History of the Global Era. And he's going to speak today about his most recent work, 2010's The Rule of Empires, which received an honorable mention from the American Publishers Award for professional and scholarly excellence. Um, I've been greatly looking forward to this. I'm sure you all too are too, so without further ado, I'll I'll turn to Tim. Thanks that. very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess I'd like to start off by saying that I'm a social historian of, of Africa, too. And so what is social history? Social history is the lived experiences of ordinary people. And that means that in looking at the invasion of Iraq in 2003, I had a very different perspective on the way that the invasion was justified and the way the events unfolded. And that was really the inspiration for me to write this book um, because history was something that was invoked by a number of the advocates of the invasion. And I felt that it was invoked in a way and cited in a way that was problematical to say the least. So this is how this project came about and this is where the subtitle of the project came about or the subtitle of my talk today. So, I'll start off by talking about the invasion of Iraq itself. And during the invasion in April 2003, Sergeant Eric Olson saw the most horrible thing I've ever seen in my life, and that's his quote, during the American armored attack on Baghdad. This thunder run, which sent tanks careening down a central Baghdad highway, highway probed the city's defenses. In returning enemy fire, it was inevitable that it would kill civilians, which is what happened when Sergeant Olson's unit caught a car bearing an Iraqi family in the crossfire. He was brutally graphic in describing the results to Mi Michael Gordon and Bernard Trainer, and this is him talking. The father was twitching on the ground with no skin on his body. I'm pretty sure he was dead. The mother was sitting on the ground, rocking back and forth. Her body was smoking, and in her arms she cradled an infant. The other casualty, I believe, was a boy about 10 years old. He had no hair and very little skin left. His eyes were fused shut as he walked around aimlessly, with layers of skin hanging off his body. Now, Olson and his fellow soldiers did not consider themselves imperial conquerors. Their leaders told them they were invading Iraq to rescue the Iraqi people from a brutal dictator. Just as General Stanley Maud, who conquered Iraq for the British Empire in 1917, reassured the people of Baghdad that his troops came, quote, not as conquerors or enemies, but as liberators, unquote, so President George Bush promised that the United States military would save Iraqis from a tyrant. A month before the March 2003 invasion, he solemnly declared, bringing stability and unity to a free Iraq will not be easy. Yet that is no excuse to, believe, to leave the Iraqi regime's torture chambers and poison labs in operation. Any future the Iraqi people choose for themselves will be better than the nightmare world that Saddam Hussein has chosen for them. If we must use force, the United States and our coalition stand ready to help the citizens of a liberated Iraq. In other words, the United States would use aggression to achieve humane ends. And the president promised that this occupation would not be permanent. Quote, we have no territorial ambitions. We don't seek an empire. Our nation is com committed to freedom for ourselves and for others, unquote. The president's anti-imperial guarantee was unremarkable, for not even the most committed neoconservatives actually suggested that the United States should govern Iraq permanently. Over at empire building is incompatible with decades of American foreign policy, and it would have incurred near universal condemnation. Instead, the Bush doctrine was a declaration of America's intention to use imperial methods in fighting the war on terror. This brings us to the role of historians in shaping contemporary American foreign policy. The architects of Operation Iraqi Freedom were advocates of hard power. They drew moral support from historians like Neil Ferguson and the revisionist members of his self-described neo-imperialist gang. These scholars and public intellectuals argued passionately that it was both ethical and feasible for the United States to impose what Deepak Law called an international moral order by using force against rogue regimes. The imperial apologists lent their weight to the Bush administration's cause by imagining the Iraqis as a backwards people needing rescue and a guiding paternal hand. 
The benefits of Western civilization justified an aggressive military enterprise, and the Nero-imperialist gang asserted that these gifts could be imposed from above and largely at gunpoint. Calling for an imperial operation in Iraq, Michael Ignatieff argued that the United States had a moral obligation to spread free markets, human rights, and democracy. The inevitability of civilian casualties like the unarmed Iraqi family that died in the crossfire during the Baghdad thunder run was largely absent from the equation. In obscuring the perspectives of common people, public intellectuals like Ignatieff and Ferguson, Ferguson legitimized the invasion of Iraq by making empire appear possible and moral. Falling back on, on imperial romanticism and nostalgia for their historical precedents, they imagined great historical empires as benevolent guarantors of global stability and prosperity. In doing so, they sought to destigmatize imperial methods. Now, this was essential, for there is no denying that Operation Iraqi Freedom was an occupation of a sovereign nation. President Bush swore that he did not have imperial ambitions, but the only thing that kept the invasion from being an explicit exercise in empire building was that he had promised that American forces would withdraw after transforming the nation into a liberal pro-Western democracy. In this sense, Bush officials assumed that it was still possible to employ the informal tactics that earlier American administrations used to replace uncooperative regimes in Latin America. Just as the United States forces installed client governments in the Caribbean after a short and inexpensive interval of direct rule, the President's advisors reasoned that they could do the same in the 21st century Middle East. Instead, the Bush administration followed in the footsteps of William Gladstone, whose dispatch of troops in 1882 to secure the Suez Canal and rescue an Egyptian client regime committed Britain to ruling Egypt as a protectorate. There we go. Uh, committed Britain to ruling Egypt as a protectorate for the next four decades. Bush officials, may not have been a, Bush officials may not have been aware of the ominous Egyptian precedent, but the self-employed imperial experts should not have dismissed this classic case study of untangling occupation. Now, it was obvious to me as a social historian of Africa that Ferguson and the other scholarly proponents of the Iraqi invasion were profoundly misrepresenting, perhaps willfully so, the true nature of empire. Watching the Bush administration prepare the country for war in early 2003, I was entirely certain that the result would be a disastrous imperial-style occupation. In forecasting this, I was not particularly present. Rather, any credible historian who looks at empires from the bottom up, that is, from the perspective of subject peoples, would have and did make the same prediction. At the very least, it was clear that common Iraqis would never forgive the violence of the conquest nor tolerate the humiliation of foreign rule. To a large degree, this imperial illiteracy rests from a problem of definition. In the last 50 years, empire has, come, has become a metaphor for the use of power for either oppression or benevolent paternalism. This confusion stems largely from the tendency to label any form of coercion as imperial. Although it may seem pedantic to insist on defining the term more precisely, definitions matter. Hazy meanings produce misunderstandings, both honest and intentional, that lead to poor policy decisions. In this case, global dominance, economic coercion, and the unbridled use of military might may be unjust, but they are not necessarily imperial. Empires did engage in such be behavior, but now the common practice of using empire as a metaphor for une any unequal power relationship has blurred its meaning. In its purest and most basic form, empire entails the formal, direct, and authoritarian rule of one group of people by another. It is born of the attempt to leverage military advantage for personal and national profit. The word empire itself comes from the Latin imperare, to command. An imperium was the territory where an imperator, or general, was in command. By the first century AD, the, Rome, the imperium romanum meant the vast territory ruled by Rome. The Romans actually had no term that corresponded to the modern meaning of, of imperialism, and the word only came into common usage in the mid-19th century to describe an intention to build an empire. It was a pejorative expression that British commentators coined to accuse Napoleon III of despotism, but it eventually became an anti-Western slogan during the Cold War. Historians have also made distinctions between formal and informal empire. The former case meant the direct rule of subject peoples, while well, informal empire implied the exercise of influence and privilege without the necessity of direct conquest. This influence might rest on the threat of military action, but it could also take the form of persuasion and assistance. As such, these informal methods could be termed soft power or hegemony. Soft power often paid greater dividends than formal imperial conquest, 
Britain, for example, built a global financial and commercial network of influence in the mid-19th century without incurring the expense and military drain of formal imperial rule. Real empire, however, entailed the direct and permanent rule of a defeated people by a conquering power. By its very nature, it can never be civilizing, humane, or liberal. Would-be Caesars throughout history promised their sponsors and countrymen substantial returns in the form of security, order, glory, religious converts, land for settlement, and most importantly, plunder. This true nature of empire was fairly straightforward in pre-modern times when it was unnecessary to disguise or apologize for such base motives. In recent centuries, however, empire builders cloaked their endeavors in philanthropy by promising to rule for the good of their subjects. This, will, this was and always will be a canard. Empire has, been never, empire has never been more than naked self-interest masquerading as virtue. Nevertheless, from the vantage point of the sponsoring government, empires were a mark of prestige, power, and civilization. To this day, Westerners often envision themselves as the heirs of an imagined, omnipotent, and enlightened imperial Rome. Popular history tends to romanticize and celebrate the Caesars, Emirs, conquistadors, viceroys, nabobs, explorers, soldiers, and missionaries who built empire. History privileges the perspectives of these elites and largely ignores the experiences of the millions of people who actually lived under imperial rule. Yet imperial nostalgia cannot disguise the reality that imperial subjecthood is intolerable. Imperial conquerors consigned defeated peoples to perpetual sub subjugation by stigmatizing them as backwards and open to exploitation. As barbarians, outlanders, tribesmen, and other categories of people allegedly on the lower rungs of the ladder of civilization, Imperial subjects were by their very nature ineligible for citizenship. A citizen from the Latin civitas was a person with the rights and privileges of full membership in a city or state. They were autonomous individuals and free men and ultimately fully realized human beings. Imperial subjects were by definition primitive and it is a crude but still accurate calculus to say that the most alien people were the most exploitable. This stigma of backwardness allowed empire builders to legitimize their conquests with civilizing rhetoric. But in truth, empires had to codify and enshrine inequality, be, inequality to be profitable and sustainable. But let's be clear, this is not a philanthropic project seeking to speak for the voiceless or right past wrongs. Injustice is an unfortunate central feature of human history and there was no sainthood in subjecthood. Nevertheless, an understanding of what it really meant to be an imperial subject exposes the fallacies of histories written from, by imperial conquerors and their apologists, thereby providing a more realistic understanding of the true limits of hard power. Policymakers and generals alike need to understand that the common people overlooked by conventional accounts of empire had the capacity to rem render imperial projects unviable. My argument, therefore, is practical rather than moral. My imperial, my imperial examples represent various evolutionary types of empire, and they demonstrate that a particular people could be imperial rulers at one point in time and imperial subjects at another. I will not have time to cover all the examples in my book in detail, but we can say that the Romans conquered the ancestors of the British, the Umayyad Arabs occupied Spain, the Spanish seized the Andes from the Incas, the British built an empire in Mughal India, the French turned the Italian descendants of the Romans into subjects, Modern Britons added Kenya to their empire, and the Nazis ruled France as an imperial power. So taking Rome first, these comparisons reveal that the defenders and critics of empire alike misunderstand some of its most fundamental qualities. They assume that the institution of empire did not change over time, and often point to Rome in asserting that imperial rule could be civilizing and popular. Yet one of the primary reasons that the Roman Empire captured the imagination of imperial enthusiasts throughout history was that empires were most viable in the ancient era. This was actually because they had relatively little capacity to intrude in the daily lives of their subjects. At a time when communication was limited to the 50 or so miles per day that a messenger could travel on a Roman road, Roman officials had no choice but to delegate authority in remote territories. Ambitious generals like Julius Caesar used this autonomy to seize power, but the limits of communication and control also opened the way for conquered peoples to become Romanized. Broadly speaking, the, dis the, dis the stability of the Roman Empire rested on its ability to assimilate subject elites who, apart from the Jews of Palestine, had not yet, did not yet have the fixed ethnic or national identities that complicated later systems of imperial rule. By learning to speak Latin and adopting Roman customs, British chieftains and their sons could become Roman citizens. 
In return, they enforced Roman authority and organized local extraction. Yet it would be wrong to call them traders or collaborators in the modern sense, for identities in the ancient world were still largely local. These relatively fluid boundaries between imperial citizen and subject opened the way for the descendants of Romanized conquered peoples to take power in Rome itself. By the third century AD, most emperors were from the provinces and native-born Italians no longer held a majority in the Senate. The Roman Empire's impressive longevity thus needs qualification. Romanization meant that the imperial state that fell to the Germanic invaders in the early fifth century AD was vastly different from the empire built by the Julio-Claudian Julio emperors nearly four centuries earlier. Imperial Rome was not as coherent or as stable as later generations of imperial partisans imagined. They also often approvingly cite Rome's assimilationist policies in arguing that empires could be civilizing and benevolent. But the toil of slaves, agricultural tenants, and peasant farmers produced the wealth of ancient empires. Classical historians like Tacitus pay little attention to them, and modern archaeology tends to be more interested in elite villas, elite villas and palaces than in the remains of agricultural homesteads. In time, many local communities throughout the empire adopted significant aspects of Roman material culture, but the extensive slave revolts and popular uprisings of the later Republic and early imperial, imperial eras testify to the darker realities of Roman rule. The Umayyad Caliphate of Al-Andalus, which I do not have time to cover in this talk, and we can certainly get to it in the Q&A, embodied many of the same imperial contradictions. It was only in the early modern era that empires gained a, a greater capacity to make more systematic demands on their subjects. Yet these imperial states still bore literal, little resemblance to the powerful and coherent empires of popular imagination. By the sixth century, most European empires were a collection of diverse and, and non-contiguous kingdoms, principalities, and religious fiefs under the nominal sovereignty of a single emperor who theoretically ruled each territory separately. This was not as problematic as it might seem. Travel and communication and production had not improved much since Roman times, which meant that most identities were still agrarian and local. Literacy was rare and religion, not nationalism, was the primary basis of imperial organization. Thus, it was not much of an issue if the Spanish, Spanish Habsburg emperors had Italian, French, and German-speaking subjects. Still, there were considerable changes taking place in the early modern world that created new opportunities for empire building. Advances in commerce and investment expanded the scope of extraction, and near-constant warfare between imperial states taught Westerners to be more aggressive and drove innovation in tactics, technology, and organization. This military revolution gave Europeans a decisive advantage when advances in ship design and navigation gave them the means to sail to Asia and the Americas in the late 15th century. In the Americas, the European military and mar maritime revolutions were disastrous for New World societies. Standing apart from the Eastern Hemisphere for all of recorded history, they were dangerously vulnerable to Eurasian infectious diseases and rapacious Western empire buildings. In European eyes, the peoples of the Americas were not fully human, which rendered their land territorial nullis and free for the taking. In underpopulated northern regions and with suitable climates, the maritime powers founded settlement colonies, but in the more tropical and densely inhabited parts of the Americas, they followed the conventional imperial template. The Spanish, having made the transition from subjects to imperial rulers in the 14th and 15th centuries, were the first to carve out a transoceanic empire in the Americas. Inspired by a militaristic evangelical Christianity that grew out of the campaigns against Muslims in Iberia, they fell upon the New World peoples mercilessly. These conquistadors operated with the sanction of the Spanish crown, but they were private military entrepreneurs seeking lands and riches. They invoked the name of Christ to legitimize their conquest, but Christian benevolence had nothing to do with their plunder and destruction of, significant civilizations of, of the significant civilizations of Central and South America. In the Andean highlands, Francisco Pizarro and his men became fabulously wealthy by looting the great Incan Empire. They also created systems of imperial rule that would have looked familiar to the Romans and Andal Andalusi Umayyads. Yet their insatiable demand for riches produced new forms of imperial extraction that were so brutal that they destroyed most Andean communities. Eventually, the embarrassed Spanish crown asserted authority over imperial territories that the opportunists like Pizarro had claimed in his name, in its name. However, when it took eight months for a message from Castile to reach Peru, there was still little that the metropolitan government could actually do to restrain the conquistadors. 
By the turn of the 17th century, Spanish settlement and imperial demands for tribute and labor in the silver mines of Potosi had wiped out indigenous Andean cultures. In their place emerged a hybrid but highly unequal social order resulting from intermarriage and cultural borrowing between Spanish settlers, surviving Andeans, and African slaves. Assimilation of this sort was vastly different from Romanization and conversion to Islam, and it brought no relief from imperial subjecthood. In the East, early modern empire building followed a vastly different trajectory, where the political, military, and epi epidemiological disparities between Westerners and Asians were far less pronounced. The great Ottoman, Persian, Mughal, and Chinese empires initially had little to fear from boatloads of armed European merchants. These Asian imperial states drew their strength from well-integrated commercial economies, complex bureaucracies, and armies equipped with gunpowder weapons. Consequently, a pattern emerged where Western merchants controlled the sea lanes, where the Central and East Asian powers were dominant on land. Mindful of the dangers faced by individual traders, they created chartered companies to raise capital and share the risks of speculative overseas adventures. The most successful were royal charters, which entailed exclusive trading rights in particular markets. However, these monopolies did not apply to foreign competitors, which forced chartered companies to arm their ships and raise private armies to compete with European rivals. They often used these military assets to seize trading stations and open markets. French, British, and Dutch companies also promoted European settlement in North America, but chartered companies in Asia became imperial powers in their own right. It was, thus, it was thus the British East India Company, not the British Crown, that actually added Mughal India to the British Empire. In Bengal, ambitious company men won the right to collect taxes in the name of the increasingly impotent Mughal emperors by de defeating their representatives at the 1757 Battle of Plessy. Posing as Mughal vassals, they wrung enormous profits out of India by taking over local revenue collection systems. Indeed, company officials known as nabobs, like Robert Clive and Warren Hastings, became so wealthy that they threatened the metropolitan political and social order when they returned home. As in the Andes, the British government had little direct control over the events in Bengal because it took half a year for messages from London to reach Calcutta. Similarly, the excesses of the nabobs eventually forced the metropolitan authorities to transform the company into a more formal imperial state. British rule in India lasted in various forms until 1947, but the development of the Western nation state rendered empire unsustainable in Europe by the close of the early modern era. In Roman times, the term nascio, something born, was a derogatory term for foreigners from the same region. But in Europe, it came to refer to a specific population or people. In essence, a nation was a compact form of identity that imagined that a particular community shared a common origin, history, language, and in most cases, territory. The absolutist continental empires began the process of turning national identities into actual states by breaking down feudal loyalties and sweeping away local privileges. While nations could not be fabricated out of whole cloth, national identities were fundamentally products of the human imagination. Nationalism presupposed that total strangers shared a sense of kinship if they spoke the same language and believed that they had common origins. In the 19th century, industrialization, urbanization, and mandatory military service and literacy helped convince Europeans to embrace these new identities. Theoretically, the resulting states had fixed and rational borders that encompassed national populations. In terms of tactics, nation building actually had a great deal in common with empire building. More often than not, local communities had to be forced to surrender their identities before they would think nationally. Those who refused to fulfill their debt to the nation by paying taxes and serving in the army faced the full coercive weight of the state. Yet nation building differed from empire building in that the end result was a population of citizens, not subjects. In return for surrendering their local identities, 19th century Europeans became fully realized individuals with the natural right of citizenship in the nation state. As compensation for heavier taxes, military conscription, and more government, they received the franchise, protection under law, and rights as individuals. Conversely, those who resisted assimilation faced institutionalized discrimination and persecution as foreign threats to the motherland. These realities made imperial subjecthood even more intolerable and eventually doomed the empires of continental Europe. Again, I did not have time to fully discuss my Italian case study, but suffice it to say that Napoleon Bonaparte was one of the first 19th century empire builders to face this new reality. 
The Corsican, general, the Corsican general's conceit was that his empire was based on ancient Rome and the ideals of the French Revolution, but he never intended to create a truly egalitarian imperial society. For the vast majority of conquered Europeans, Napoleonic subjecthood met excessive and unyielding demands for tribute to enrich France and uh, raise conscripts to fill his armies. Although it rivaled the Roman Empire in its scope and military might, the Napoleonic Empire was surprisingly fragile. Ironically, its capacity to place more direct demands on its subjects was as much a weakness as it was a strength. It would take a while longer for national sentiment to cohere in Central and Eastern Europe, but it is, and it is noteworthy that apart from Britain, ancien regime empires rather than nations defeated Napoleon. Nevertheless, Napoleonic rule stimulated the growth of nationalist sentiment throughout Europe, and in seeking the right of self-determination, nationalists threatened the Austro-Hungarian, Russian, and Ottoman empires. Nationalism, in effect, became an ideology of revolution and liberation, as intellectuals convinced the subjects of these vast multi-ethnic states to demand their own nations. Few realized it at the time, but the strength of the new and populist identities of these new and populist identities rendered empire untenable in Europe. This muscular nationalism was a product of the 19th century industrial West. In combination with capitalism and the industrial revolution, it created opportunities for empire building overseas, but the new nation states were slow to act on them. With most of continental Europe focused on rebuilding after the Napoleonic Wars and the United States pushing westward, Britain was the only nation with the means to expand globally during the middle decades of the 19th century. Yet, in Britain, this was actually a period of widespread opposition to further empire building. Free traders from Adam Smith to radicals like Richard Cobden and John Bright considered formal empires an enormous expense in terms of manpower and treasure that paid minimal returns to the nation as a whole. They also charged that imperial special interests like the Nabobs had a corrupting influence on British society. While no one imagined giving up India, this anti-imperial lobby opposed further annexations and called for the government to withdraw from money-losing territories in West Africa. Indeed, empire had become so disreputable at mid-century that British propagandists attacked Napoleon III as an imperialist. Now, Britain's status as the world's dominant commercial, <coughs> industrial, and naval power meant that it did not need an expensive formal empire. Instead, it used its economic might and judici judicious applications of punitive force to bend governments and peoples around the globe to its will. When the Chinese tried to close their borders to Indian opium, the British fought the opium wars to reopen their markets in the name of free trade. This sort of military force was unnecessary in Latin American nations like Argentina, where British inve investors owned so much of the country's fixed capital assets that they dominated the country politically. The settler colonies in Australia, New Zealand, and Canada were significant, but they were well on the way to self-government. Thus, with the exception of India, for most of the 19th century, Britain's informal empire was more important and valuable than its remaining imperial possessions. British leaders only fell back on the protectionism of formal empire when rival Western powers threatened their global dominance. This began in earnest in the 1870s when industrial overproduction and an ensuing tariff war led to business failures, mass unemployment, and the first truly global depression. Economic hindsight shows that these events were part of a boom and bust cycle of early industrial capitalism, but contemporary observers worried that Western economies would never recover. Many governments were therefore unprepared to listen to the blandishments, well, excuse me, many governments were prepared to listen to the blandishments of imperial special interest groups that promised new conquests would alleviate the crisis by providing captive markets and reserve sources of raw materials. Even the British government, which should have known better, succumbed to these wildly unrealistic promises. In other words, the recent British Empire was born in fear and weakness, not strength. No longer able to defend their interests by e informal methods, the British joined industrial rivals in exploiting short-term military advantages to claim new empires in Africa and Asia. Historians termed this wave of conquest the new imperialism. In essence, the Western powers used force to integrate conquered peoples into the emerging global, global capitalist economy on decidedly unfavorable terms. The advances of the Industrial Revolution made speculative imperial adventures once again seem, seem feasible and lucrative. Submarine, cable, submarine telegraph cables, iron steam-powered ships, and, the adva and advances in the prevention and treatment of tropical diseases all contributed to their sense of confidence and opportunity. Ultimately, however, Maxim guns, repeating rifles, 
and soft-core dum-dum bullets, which were illegal in Europe, and exploding artillery shells were really what made the new imperialism possible. As in the early modern Andes, these weapons gave a new generation of conquistadors the means to win decisive but inexpensive victories over much larger forces. Joined by a newly industrialized and nationally minded Japan, European empire builders used these tools to dominate the peoples of the world who did not yet explicitly identify themselves as members of a nation state. Their conquests included all of Africa except for Ethiopia, Malaya, Indochina, Micronesia, Korea, and new spheres of influence in China. In North America, the United States completed its economic, excuse me, completed its colonial Western expansion before wresting its first formal and explicitly imperial territories from Spain in the Spanish-American War. Ironically, the nations that took part in this new imperial scramble were liberal democracies. Soldiers and, adventur and adventurers therefore had to use nationalist and humanitarian rhetoric to justify their self-serving conquests. In other words, the new empire builders promised that they would strike an impossible balance in enriching their national sponsors while civilizing backwards peoples. Even most missionaries and other well-intentioned supporters of the new imperialism accepted the social Darwinistic notion that Africans and Asians were inherently inferior. While Sub-Saharan Africans did not have steamships, telegraphs, or hospitals, it is telling that the true mark of progress in modernity dur during this period remained the ability to win wars. In 1893, 50 British South African police troopers armed with six Maxim guns killed 3,000 Ndebele warriors in just 90 minutes. Five years later, it took British forces a mere five hours to massacre over 11,000 Sudanese at the Battle of Andaman. These shock and awe methods gave birth to the supposedly liberal empires that contemporary imperial, imperial apologists depict as humane and civilizing. The Kenyan experience, which is what I know best, of empire demonstrates conclusively that the new empires were neither liberal or uplifting. Imperial conquest in East Africa opened the door to settlers who hypocritically claimed to civilize the local population by forcing them to work. They took 999-year leases on farms in the White Highlands on the assumption that British rule would last for centuries. As a mass confidence game, the new imperialism briefly intimidated defeated peoples into believing that Western empire builders were superior and, more importantly, invincible. In the in 1950s Kenya, the Mau Mau Rebellion punctured this illusion conclusively, and the expense of putting down the revolt, coupled, coupled with the atrocities committed by the settlers and the imperial security forces, led many metropolitan Britons to realize that the promises of the new imperialism were fundamentally hollow. Consequently, Britain's new African empire lasted less than a century, and the legacy of this supposedly modernizing institution was barely viable national boundaries, economic stagnation, and a legacy of corrupt authoritarian rule. While it took some time for Westerners to realize that the new African and Asian empires were ephemeral, Adolf Hitler's disastrous attempt to create a European continental empire made it explicitly clear that imperial projects were not viable in the nationalist era. Now, taking Nazi-controlled Europe as an imperial case study is controversial because few, few historians count the Third Reich as part of the new imperialism. At the time, many Europeans would have taken offense at the equation of their suffering under German rule with the subjecthood of supposedly less advanced African and Asians. At first glance, the missionaries and well-intentioned well humanitarians who supported the occupation of Kenya appear to have little in common with the Nazis. But their denigration of Africans as primitives was a more benign form of the racist ideologies that underpinned Hitler's agenda in Europe. For the first time in over a century, Western Europeans were conquered by a rapacious foreign power. The French experience of Nazi rule demonstrated that any defeated people, no matter how advanced, could be transformed into subjects. Just as some Kenyans worked with British empire builders to further personal and communal interests, a surprisingly large number of Frenchmen supported Marshal Philippe Patin's attempt to reach an accord with the Nazi occupiers. The Vichy regime and its sympathizers faced recrimination for their collaboration after the war, thereby linking a once innocuous word with traitorous imperial cooperation. Far more honest than 20th century empire builders, Hitler unapolog unapologetically declared that he took his country to war to advance the interests of, of the superior German race. In the East, he attempted to replicate the achievements of North American colonists by creating Lebensraum, or living space, through the extermination of Slavs and Jews. 
The French and other Western Europeans, by comparison, were to become more conventional imperial subjects. As permanent helots, they would, they would enrich the Reich through tribute and labor. Nazi Germany was unquestionably the most barbaric and brutal empire of the modern era in its treatment of Jews and other supposedly inferior peoples. But it was remarkably adept at wringing unprecedented amounts of wealth from its subjects. The Nazis accomplished this by combining looting, slave labor, and other time-tested methods of extraction with the sophisticated manipulation of the instruments of modern industrial capitalism. In this sense, the Nazis were too efficient. For the nakedly exploitive nature of their imperial enterprise threatened their subjects with destitution, starvation, and ultimately extermination. The Vichy French strategy of co collaboration was a fatal dead end, and people throughout occupied Europe soon realized that there was no reaching an accommodation with the German rulers. These realities doomed the Nazi imp imperial project. As with Napoleon, the European powers again united against an aspiring empire builder. This time, however, Hitler's excesses struck a decisive blow against empire because the Nazi doctrines of racial supremacy and the resulting Holocaust discredited the humanitarian notions of racial backwardness that legitimized the new imperialism overseas. The European empo imperial powers initially hoped to revitalize their global empires after the war. And in doing so, they refused to recognize that the spread of popular nationalism, nationalism fanned by wartime propaganda, doomed the new imperialism. This became evident in the 1950s as one formal imperial territory after another gained a seat in the United Nations General Assembly. In 1960, their intense hatred of empire led to a resolution affirming the right of self-determination for all peoples and explicitly rejecting the primi primary I legitimizing ideology of the new imperialism. Now let's come back to Iraq. The era of actual empire is conclusively over. Nevertheless, policy debates over the Iraq war still revolved around imperial themes. Critics on the left indicted the United States for behaving imperially in adopting an aggressive foreign policy, while, while right-wing revisionists and neoconservatives sought to rehabilitate empire to demonstrate that military force was the most effective way to impose, impose global order and security. To be sure, no one in the Bush administration seriously aspired to acquire an empire when they evaded Iraq. Even the most ardent imperial apologist knew that this was simply no longer possible or politically defensible. Rather, the architects of the Iraqi occupation believed that they could use authoritarian imperial methods to replace an enemy regime with a liberal pro-Western government. Like earlier generations of empire builders, they continued to believe that hard power could be used to persuade, inspire, and re-educate a defeated inferior people. Seeking historical validation for this wishful thinking, the neo-imperial lobby returned to the myth of the liberal progressive empire. In doing so, they conveniently forgot how these empires came apart under the, oppression of, under the pressure of anti-imperial nationalism in the 1960s, not to mention the revulsion which most Africans and Asians recall their former subjecthood. What mattered was that empire still retained a seductive hold on the popular imagination. The media's tendency to depict non-Westerners non as tribal, traditional, and backwards meant that the civilizing propaganda that legitimized the new imperialism still carried weight with the general public. America's invasion of occupation Iraq was built on these misconceptions. In overthrowing Saddam Hussein and occupying Iraq, the, British the Bush administration sought to change the balance of power in the Middle East by creating a liberal, democratic, and pro-Western Arab nation that theoretically would set an example for the region, make peace with Israel, embrace free market capitalism, and offer the United States access to its oil and military bases. The United States military won a decisive victory in Iraq, but this imperial reasoning doomed the ensuing occupation. Critics of operation of of Operation Iraqi Freedom rightly blamed the Bush, the Bush administration for grossly underestimating the resources it would take to govern a nation of 24 million people. General Tommy Franks expected to hand off control of the country to an Iraqi client state and planned to begin withdrawing troops immediately after President Bush declared the phase, combat phase officially over. While there is no question that the military and civil officials responsible for running Iraq after Saddam's downfall were guilty of gross incompetence in planning the occupation, many critics of, of the Iraq war made the fundamental mistake of assuming that the right combination of nation-building strategies and troop deployments would have allowed American occupiers to produce a pro-Western Iraqi regime. <laughs> 
The new empire builders who conquered much of Africa and Asia in the preceding century were far more undermanned and underfinanced than the Americans. But they never had to deal with the level of resistance that the U.S. troops faced in Iraq because their subjects' identities were still largely local. This made it comparatively easy to recruit, to recruit allies from the, sub, from the subject population by exploiting local rivalries. The Coalition Provisional Authority, or CPA, never actually controlled Iraq because its authority extended only as far as the United States military could shoot. Liberated from Saddam's control, controls, common Iraqis were free to do as they pleased outside the immediate gaze of the Americans. There were no Romanized gentlemen or tribal chiefs to force them to accept the authority of the foreign conquering power. President Bush may have been sincere in disavowing imperial ambitions in Iraq, but using military force to acquire millions of unwilling foreign subjects inevitably led to the methods of formal empire. And the CPA was indeed a formal imperial government because it sought to rule Iraq directly during the first year of the occupation but it was also unquestionably one of the most inept imperial regimes in recorded history. Operating out of one of Saddam Hussein's palace complexes in a fortress known as the Green Zone, it was almost entirely isolated from common Iraqis. From within this bunkered enclave, for Ambassador Paul Bremer sought to remake, a Iraq society, remake Iraq by creating a new army, introducing a new currency, imposing a market economy, liberalizing commercial and investment laws, and most importantly, restoring oil production. Earlier generations of imperial subjects suffered far worse indignities. Nevertheless, the experience of invasion and occupation was extremely traumatic for a great many people, even if they hated Saddam Hussein. As Majid Hamid al-Bayadi sermonized in a Baghdad mosque in the immediate aftermath of Bremer's directives, he said, they have destroyed our institutions, our people, and our security. They have totally erased us. Watching American soldiers patrol the streets of Baghdad, an Iraqi lamented, they're walking over my heart, I feel like they're crushing my heart. To him, it mattered little that the Americans told themselves they were Iraqi saviors. They came to liberate us. Liberate us from what? We have traditions, morals, and customs. The consequences of the Bush administration's inability to assert full authority over Iraq were enormous. Earlier generations of empire builders understood that in effective imperial rule depended on maintaining the illusion of invincibility to convince subjects that it was suicidal to resist. The Americans, however, were dangerously vulnerable in Iraq. In an incident widely reported in the U.S. media, a Yemeni engineering student walked up to a soldier drinking ginger ale at Baghdad University and shot him in the head. Incidents like these multiplied in the first year of the occupation because American attempts to create new Iraqi security forces were dismal failures. Moreover, the primary function of a formal empire was to extract tribute, but the CPA's inability to restart the Iraqi oil industry meant that, that wealth flowed from the United States to Iraq to sustain the occupation. Any imperial expert would recognize that the Iraqi insurgents succeeded because they denied the Americans the local allies needed to govern the country by murdering and intimidating anyone who became too closely associated with the occupying power. To this end, a resistance leader explicitly made cooperation a capital crime. Every Iraqi or foreigner who works with the coalition is a target. Ministries, mercenaries, tra translators, businessmen, cooks or maids, it doesn't matter the degree and note the term of collaboration. To sign a contract with the occupiers is to sign your death certificate. Iraqi or not, these are traitors. This intimidation made it impossible for the CPA to use the divide and rule tactics to use divide and rule tax, tactics to recruit local allies. Insurgents shot down Aquila al-Hashemi, a member of Bremer's showcase Iraqi governing council on her own doorstep, and assassinated ex-Bathist officials who worked with the CPA. While they were divided along sectarian and ideological lines, the various factions of the Iraqi ins insurgency generally agreed on the fundamental goal of expelling the Americans, and they would never have been able to operate effectively if the general public was not willing to shelter them. Earlier generations of imperial subjects had the same objective, but they lacked the organization and means to resist. In the 21st century, transnational flows of funding and support and the accessibility of advanced weaponry made it much easier to resist a foreign occupier. Ex-army officers provided essential training, but the insurgents learned how to make improvised explosive devices or bombs on the internet that, could, that used common household devices like cell phones and garage door openers to set them off. George Bush's military surge in early 2007 restored a measure of order 
but did little to change the fundamental realities of the occupation. Still, this allowed many of the war's backers to regain a measure of credibility by attacking the Bush administration for failing to make proper use of America's mass, vast military might. Latching on to the seemingly, seeming effectiveness of the surge, they blamed Donald Rumsfeld for grossly underestimating the number of soldiers it would take to control Iraq. In fact, popular revulsion over the chronic violence stemming from the Civil War and insurgency was the real reason that the unrest appeared to fade. Now, in conclusion, although much of the work that drew on, on imperial precedence to legitimize the adventure in Iraq was inherently flawed and pro pro propagandistic, there are still lessons to be learned from a comparative historical study of imperial regimes. The first of these is that imperial institutions evolved over time. And it is facile to cite the Roman Empire, a product of the ancient world, as a precedent in, in formulating contemporary foreign policy. Secondly, empires were never humane, and imperial subjecthood was always demeaning and intol intolerable. The current romanization of the British and French empires of the last century as omnipotent and benevolent rests on nostalgia, willful historical ignorance, and the exoticization of non-Western peoples. Throughout history, imperial special interests, from the Caesars to the conquistadors to Halliburton, covered up these realities by disguising their avarice in the guard of patriotism and humanitarianism. In doing so, they observed the true fiscal, military, and moral price of empire. But imperial conquerors were also never as powerful as they imagined. Lacking the political will, manpower, and financial resources to govern an entire population directly, imperial states needed allies from subject communities to assert their authority. Although it may seem counterintuitive, the most long-lived empires were those most adept at recruiting reliable local allies and least efficient in extracting tribute. Roman historical texts and archaeological ruins are grand, but the Romans themselves had little direct influence over their subjects. The Umayyad conquerors of Al-Andalus suffered from the same problem. In the pre-modern era, conquistadors and nababs found it relatively easy to turn subject communities against each other when most identities were narrow and local. But they also had to share power with, clients, with subject clients to collect taxes and rule effectively. This meant that while common people suffered individually under foreign rule, the strength of the local limited the overall extractive reach of imperial states. Thirdly, the recent empires born of the new imperialism failed because they provoked popular resistance by breaking down the more parochial identities that had kept subject communities manage manageably compartmentalized. It therefore became much harder to enlist imperial proxies when cooperation became treason treasonous collaboration and the scope of identity expanded from the local to the national, and self-determination became a national right. Lastly, empire has become even more impossible in the 21st century when accelerated globalization has largely erased the West's technological, economic, and political advantages. Nationalism played a central role in destroying the world's last formal empires, but in the contemporary era, transnational flows of ideas, capital, migrants, weapons, and the willing practitioners of political violence mean that conquerors can no longer isolate and reduce a defeated population to subjecthood. The American and Soviet failures in Vietnam and Afghanistan were the first in indication that common people could blunt hard power by drawing on aid from sympathetic rival powers. The collapse of the Soviet Union lulled the Bush administration into thinking that it could still use imperial methods because Saddam Hussein had no influential foreign patrons. Yet the successful anti-American insurgency in Iraq demonstrates that larger non-national identities like Arabism and Islamicism have given even weak and divided communities the means to defy a seemingly omnipotent con conquering power. Now, as memories of the bloodshed and chaos of the occupation recede, and recede even more after the, the American um, execution of Saddam Hussein, not Saddam Hussein, um, Osama bin Laden, the architects of Operation Iraqi Freedom are sure to argue that, that it ultimately achieved its goals and served a greater good. In doing so, they will try to obscure the role in the deaths of tens if not hundreds of thousands of people by returning to the lie that imperial projects can achieve liberal and humanitarian ends. Yet the balance sheet for Operation Iraqi Freedom as of 2008 shows that its humanitarian promises were fundamentally hollow. Some of the war's architects were simply naive and dangerously idealistic in believing their own rhetoric. But the scholarly champions of imperial methods should have known better. In 2007, 
Neil Ferguson's acknowledgement of Iraq's descent into civil war began with the comment, oh dear, quote unquote. History has forgotten the earlier generations of subject peoples who suffered the results of similar hypocritical imperial promises, and there is no reason to assume that the experiences of ordinary Iraqis will have any greater resonance in America's popular imagination. Yet in listening to the inevitable revisionism that is to come, we ignore the lessons of empire at our peril. Common people now have the capacity to thwart imperial ambitions, and history shows us that imperial fortunes can turn quickly. Incan nobles, Mughal emperors, and 20th century Frenchmen all learned that it was possible to go from ruler to ruled virtually overnight. Conquerors may self-servingly portray defeated peoples as exotic or backwards, but we are all potential imperial subjects. Thank you. I guess, questions? Yes. Thank you very much. I found that fascinating. Um, and this may just be a terminological question, in which case mm. feel free to defer it. But mm. I noticed that you shy away from using the term neo-imperialism, mm. um, which is a question I find comes up a lot kind of in historiography and teaching. And it's a term I think that, well, I'm going to I think a lot of times it kind of lacks a, the kind of significance and depth that you gave in mm -hmm. your talk. And I'm wondering if that is part of what you're trying to get at, or if, um, I mean, if it is this kind of empty signifier, or if there is a kind of another meaning that you see for it that's different from what, you, what you're addressing here, or, or if I'm just putting words in your mouth. No, it's a good question. And I got very, before I wrote this book, I was far more loose in my use of the term imperial and imperialism and empire. But that's one of the things I realized in doing the research for the book and reading how empire was being used um, to essentially mean being bad. You know, if, if you're you know, from Star Wars to you don't like American foreign policy or you don't like any other go government, you call it an empire. And because the, the terminology was being blurred, I realized I had to be far more precise. And my pre precise definition of empire is the permanent occupation of one group of people by another. And that really is over. I mean, I think Iraq has, has shown that. So to the people who are using the term neo-imperialism are making a point that I think that whatever it is that is, is receiving the label is behaving in an imperial fashion. But that doesn't really mean they're creating empires. And that's one of the reasons why I, I th th writing this was tricky, because a lot of the terms I, I fell back on for crutches, I found I couldn't use anymore when I realized that imperialism dates from the mid-19th century, and you can't use it before that. Yes. A lot of uh, supporters of the war in Iraq kind of used, uh, especially later on in the war, it seems like used the occupations of Germany and Japan mm -hmm. uh, post World War II as sort of analogs. Uh, where do the, where do those fit into sort of an imperial framework? That's a that's a great question. I mean, the question is 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 and it was cited as precedent. In other words, that that the United States in defeating the Axis powers then had this benevolent period of occupation. Um, that produced, I think, quite arguably um, beneficial results. And I've had that question before, and it's, it's, it is a really, I think, telling one for, for, to ask after this talk. The difference is, is that there was never any indication that the United States planned to stay. And there was profound reason uh, that was communicated almost right away to the Germans and Japanese that if you cooperate, we'll go more quickly. And the, se the third factor was the Cold War. Um, as early as 1946 and 1947, the United States was pivoting from looking at these two nations as, as going from looking at them as enemies to potential and important allies in the Cold War. So all of those factors um, were not at play in Iraq. Um, even though George Bush did announce that we intended to leave quickly and we intended to follow this model, if you actually look at the way the, uh, the CPA behaved in Iraq in, the first, um, in the, the first year of the occupation, it didn't create the incentives or the security for individual Iraqis to play that cooperating role. But on the other hand, and this goes back to another point I made at the talk, is that the Iraqis weren't willing to be as impatient as the Japanese or Germans were because they had alternatives that the Japanese and Germans didn't have. So you might say, well, if they had been more patient, some of the, the more positive aspects of a U.S. occupation might have come to the fore. Um, but that's another way the world has changed since then, um, is that they had alternatives and they weren't willing to wait. <laughs>
Yes. Um, you mentioned that one of the main strategies of <coughs> empires, one of the main strategies of expanding empires uh, in the early modern era was to pit local powers against each other. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, in places like in Afghanistan where there's still like widespread local identities, mm -hmm. uh, how has America like failed to um, kind of control that in the same way that early modern empires did? Well, the local has never disappeared. I mean, that is, um, you know, that, I think that's one of the fallacies of globalization is that we have uh, the idea of globalization, that globalization has, has erased what it means to identify with a particular place. Um, localism is still strong, but even though there are identities in Afghanistan that are strongly local based on family, clan, language, there are also much larger identities like pan-Islamicism, um, which I, which I um, cited in the talk. And this means that, again, people who do not want to tolerate a foreign occupation or resist a foreign occupation have resources and alternatives that simply were not available to somebody living in early modern Germany or in the, the, the highlands of Peru. Um, so, you know, to, to sort of turn it into a policy blueprint for Afghanistan, I guess I have to confess that my view of these things is, is with imperial methods is don't even try. Um, you know, I think that's if that's the lesson that could be learned from what's happened in the last 10 years is you may think you may be able to play off the old imperial um, game plan, but it, you have to tear it up. It just doesn't work anymore. Uh, I've got two questions. Uh, the one, for, I'll start with this one because we just talked about the same subject. Uh, I think you probably would agree, though, it is not about your talk, that among the things available to people who are in these subject positions is nonviolent strategies and tactics, mm -hmm. and that uh, since Gandhi they've proliferated, and in more recent decades they've become much more successful. The other question goes back to Iraq, uh, and I can't quite agree. I, I was pretty involved in the discussion about Iraq in here and in New Hampshire. Uh, I can't agree that the Bush administration went in there to create liberal democracy. Uh, it seems to me that's belied by the fact they had plans for building five large permanent bases and that uh, the only way they could, the government, the U.S. government has been able to negotiate a withdrawal from Iraq is essentially to surrender those plans. And wouldn't those bases, if they had been built, been a form of permanent occupation? That's an interesting question um, because the, the, we, that is one of the one of the debates is is the United States an empire, and this is something that that there's a if you look at all the books, you just do a Google search for United States and empire, you'll you'll find an extensive literature on that, and the argument that people make for the United States being United States being an empire is are these military bases around the world, um, but as we saw in the case with the Philippines and to some degree Okinawa, um, American military bases exist at the sufferance of the host community. So I would come down, again, on my very strict definition of empire, which I've adopted only recently, I would say that doesn't make you an empire. It makes you maybe a hegemon um, on the Athenian model, um, but not a, a, an empire. Now, to come back to what the Bush administration was really up to in Iraq, I'm doing them the respect of taking them at their word. Um, because for my, the purposes of my argument, I'm quite happy to take them at their word because even if we take them at their word that this was their intention, it was naive. And I believe there are some people in, in the Bush administration that were flat out naive. But also, as with the new imperialism in the, in the late 19th, 20th century, there were also people who were willing to take advantage of that naivete, who would argue that, okay, this is, we're gonna do all of these good things but they had self-serving agendas, e either personal, um, corporate, or maybe even national. And, but, and that goes back to this question of, actually your, your questions tie together, it goes back to the question of nonviolence. Because in the 20th and 21st centuries, the nations that built empires, and even the Soviet Union, which for all intents and purposes was the czarist empire in new clothes, had to essentially pretend not to be empires. They had to portray themselves as being benevolent and legitimate and um, be engaged in essentially good works. 
So nonviolent resistance is, is a powerful counter to that. And that is, I think, one of the reasons, I think Gandhi was one of the key factors in delegitimizing empire because particularly when you have a, a liberal um, democracy like Britain governing authoritarian, as an authoritarian power out in its colonies, sooner or later you're going to have to reconcile those things. And not what nonviolent resistance does is it shines a bright light on these authoritarian tactics that would never be tolerated back at home. And I think if you look at that as a narrative of the 20th century, it's one of these reasons why no one will ad even admit to being an empire anymore. It used to be empires were a sign of greatness. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of the, um, the famous writer from Rhodesia, Doris Lessing, um, was given, a, it was made a knight of the British Empire or some such thing. And, and in turning it down, she said, there is no British Empire anymore. So even, um, even while Britain will still use that kind of terminology as part of its, its cultural traditions, I mean, there is no nation on earth that I'm aware of that proudly declares itself to, to be imperial. I taught a course in the American Revolution here for uh, 40 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as part of the, say, I, I used to teach a course in the American Revolution here. I'm very uh, aware of the significance in that event of written constitutions. Mm -hmm. You have not even use the word constitution in your process of disintegration of empires. I've just read a book on the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Moldova, Ukraine, Estonia all had written constitution that involved the right to secede, although mm -hmm. it wasn't spelled out how they're going to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, in the process of the elimination of, or the downgrading of empires, uh, uh, what role do you see of the form adopted from the American Revolution of written constitutions? I certainly paid a good deal of attention to that attempt in Iraq, and I expect something like this is going to happen in Libya. Hmm. Well, thank you for that question because what you, in asking it, what you've done is you've let me speak to something that I cut out of the talk because I didn't have time for, which is the difference between empires and colonies. Um, the, the colonies come from the Latin colonia, which were es essentially settlers from, in this case, demobilized Roman military veterans that were founded, the settlements that were founded in occupied territories, and they had the full rights of Roman citizenship. Um, and colonialism and imperialism are often used as synonyms, aren't they? And this is one of the, the crutches that I had to stop myself from using because I, in term, if we're going to be very precise, there is a fundamental difference between a colony and an empire. A colony is, as you just said, colonies get constitutions. Colonies can evolve into citizenship, into, into, into parts, are considered to be part of the metropolitan home. Therefore, colonies can evolve in, into societies of citizens with rights and with constitutions. If you are a true empire, the last thing you want to do is give your subjects a constitution because you are putting limits on your control of what you, limits on how you can control them and what you can do with them. So this goes back to the question is, is the United States or was the United States ever an empire? And by my strict definition, the United States was only an empire while it was ruling the bits of the Spanish, the former Spanish empire, the Philippines, um, Cuba for a while, Puerto Rico, Guam, things like that. Um, the United States behaved as a colonial power, began as a colonial institution, and then behaved as a colonial power in the way it conquered the West. Um, so if we go back to the new imperialism in Africa, if you look at when African continents, forgive me for keep coming back to African precedents, but it's what I know. Um, African colonies only get constitutions right when the British and the French are leaving. And it's, it's a, it, it literally is a rush. It's, it's almost as much of a rush job. In fact, the constitution writing process in Iraq took longer than in many cases the way that these constitutions for former African colonies were written. So it's a fair point. I mean, and the British, particularly themselves, blurred this point when they talked about their empire because when they wanted to, particularly in the, in the turn of the 20th century, when they wanted to point to the benevolent things they were doing in the empire, uh, 
they would point to Canada and Australia and New Zealand and, and say, look, this is the sign of what we do with our colonies. We give them rights, we give them constitutions, because they did begin to have the, the trappings of representative democracy. And they would point to the rest of the empire and say, this is what's in store for you if you'll just wait a little while longer. But as Frederick Lugard, who is the, the, the main ideologue of British rule in Africa, he had that time frame as about three or 400 years. So I'm going to put that aside um, and, and for what it was. Yes? I just add one more example to what you just last said, just to remind people, because it was uh, a lot of people uh, raised their eyebrows when it happened. But it, when, when Hong Kong was about to be turned back to the Chinese, that's when they began to institute voting rights, et cetera, for Hong Kong. Exactly. Right? And that's just, you know, it wasn't 300 years later, but it was a long time later. Yeah, and one of the, the qualifications I really want to make is that it, it is that I, one of the, and it jumped out at me as I put these case studies against each other, is that in every single one of these empires, there are special interest groups that are the real proponents of empire. So it's not as though the metropolitan government in Britain or Britons, you know, were conspiring against Hong Kong. It, for the most part, people in the metropole don't pay much attention to empire, except for the, gla the grand parades and, and, and the, in the case of, of Britain, the, the pink parts on the map, all the parts of the British colonies were traditionally pink on a globe. And you could look at that and feel good. But I mean, there's been a lot of debate among economic historians about whether the English taxpayer suffered or gained as a result of having an empire. And I'm very much of the persuaded by the fact that, by the argument that they didn't gain at all. They paid higher taxes. I mean. So I, I say that to kind of defend Britons for, for you know, coming late to the party in Hong Kong. I mean, it was, it was many, in many ways, it was a reflection of the fact that this was kind of a special project. It always was, and it just got left off the books. And I, that's the way I, I basically see Iraq, too, as kind of a special project. I mean, I, I don't think Americans, when you know, they answered opinion polls in 2003, that they were in favor of this, um, were in favor of, of what we got at this point in time. Yeah. Can I follow up then with a, with a just, um, um, you know, when the, uh, when, when, when Bush was uh, about to launch the war in Iraq, I, I sort of said semi-facetiously uh, to some of my students that um, we, maybe we should think a little bit differently about what happened there. You know, suppose a large multinational corporation, let's say an oil company, called up the White House and said, we would like to tap the world's largest uh, untapped, you know, oil reserves, mm. but we don't have an army. Um, do you think you could lend us your army for a while so that we could secure those for you since you are the world's leading beneficiary of such a move? And the White House says, sure. But today, of course, or yesterday, I guess BP was defending its right to huge, uh, or the all the oil companies were arguing that, that, that they were entitled to these further benefits. Well, I think and I one of the arguments they used was you know, we might pick up our marbles and go elsewhere. There are other people in the world who might appreciate what we're trying to do. It's so, I, I mean, that puts a whole new twist on the concept. You know, I think right now we're in a transition. That's my point. Well, the interesting thing is, looking at it historically, is if you look at, I mentioned 19th century West Africa and, and how empire really had fallen out of disfavor in, in Britain in the mid-19th century, so much so that they're the ones who coined the negative term imperialist. And there was a strong move in the House of Parliament to, um, it failed, but to take a strict cost-benefit analysis, look at the, the four significant small possessions that Britain had in West Africa, um, and to withdraw from them. But at the same time, there was a very vocal mercantile, particularly a palm oil lobby, that was pushing Britain, the British government, saying, no, intervene. We're, we're, getting our, we're getting cheated by these shifty African traders. They're, they're traitors, I mean, tra palm oil traders. They're manipulating currency. 
we could be making a lot more profits if you stepped in and created proper an environment for commerce by establishing a uniform currency and rule of law because by their definition there was no rule of law. And the interesting thing is the British government largely ignored them until there were other reasons for them to listen to them, largely when the French began grabbing things. Um, and there was this fear of, of um, a global uh, depression that they would never would recover from and they had to grab territory. So I think the, I just bring that up because I think there will always be commercial interests who would love to get the, you know, to rent the army of whatever state they have to essentially win on the battlefield what they can't get through supposedly free market capitalism. I think I I'm more interested in what leads nations to listen to them. You know, and I think that was the case in, in, two, in 2003. I think the, the country was so traumatized by uh, the events of, two, of 2001 that they were willing to listen to these special interests that you probably shouldn't have listened to. So I, I guess, are we done? <laughs> okay, thank you.